exclusion hurts us all. So we have a mission at Microsoft, which is to empower every individual and organization on the planet to achieve more. So when we don't intentionally include people with disabilities in the things that we create, we are actively working against our mission. So that's why um, it's so important to us at Microsoft to make sure that we're, we bring accessibility in as soon as we can. But that being said, I want to talk to you about uh, a story of when we unintentionally created exclusion that we had to fix, and that led to something that I think is, is a valid inclusive design um, sort of project. So our Surface Laptop 2, um, we're now on Surface Laptop 4, so our Surface Laptop 2 had a lot of challenges for the blind. So I'm going to zoom in on this keyboard here. Uh, oops, pull back. So what happens on this keyboard is that if you look at that F4 key, um, it shares that key with mute. And the only way that you can switch between the function of mute or F4 is that function lock key on the bottom row of the keyboard, the one with the light. So if you're a keyboard user on Windows, um, the, the keyboard shortcut to close an application on Windows is Alt F4. And so screen reader users primarily use keyboard. And so they would be hitting Alt F4 to close, like, to close the apps that they were in. But because that function lock key could only be, you only knew the state of that key if you could see that light, sometimes those users were muting their, their computer. So you can imagine a screen reader user who depends on audio um, accidentally muting their computer when they think they're closing an app and the frustration that that must cause because they think they're closing an app and what they do is they're they're shutting off their audio so then all of a sudden they can't hear anything it's very frustrating so with the surface laptop 3 we did a few things and the first thing we did was we got function lock added to what they call the human interface devices specification so this is something that like um, microsoft created but we share with like uh, with the USB consortium and all of our um, and all the people who make um, devices. So keyboard hid is basically the spec that allows you to take a keyboard and plug it into a PC and know it's going to work. And you can plug it into a Mac and it'll know you'll know it'll work. Um, that's what hid is. And so we had to basically lobby that board to get um, FN lock had it added to hid because before we did this like a few years ago, FN lock wasn't part of the hid specification. So what did we do? We got FN lock added to HID so that um, we could put firmware in the keyboard to tell the operating system the state of that key. So if you use a screen reader and you hit caps lock, it'll go caps lock on, caps lock off. The screen reader will tell you the state of that key. Before we did this with the FN key, that wasn't possible, not only on our machines, but on anyone's machines. So FN was just not known to the, the state of the OS. So we added FN lock to HID. We, um, so you, when you click it with Windows Narrator right now, you, it'll say FN lock on, FN lock off. The other thing that we did was we added, uh, we moved the mute key away from F4 to F2 and put volume up on F4. So that if you don't have that state right, you're not doing a destructive action by doing Alt F4. Your only worst case scenario is you're turning your volume up. <clears throat> so we rearranged that keyboard layout. And if you, if you can, it's, it's really small, but if you look above the F4 on that key, there's a little dot on top of that, um, on top of that key. It's a tactile bump. It's the same thing that you have on F and J in your keyboards. Now we did this because there was an affordance with desktop keyboards that was lost um, to a lot of laptop keyboards as they got compressed. So I'm going to hold up my keyboard and I hope you can see it because I can't see myself. But on a desktop keyboard, um, typically between the F4 and F5 and F8 and F9 keys, there's a gap. There's actually like a, a, a gap. And that gap is an affordance for people to know where they are on those keys. So we added tactile bumps to F4 and F8 on our Surface laptop keyboards. And all of our keyboards going forward are going to do this. So that was us fixing bugs that we made, right? So fast forward, um, last fall, we launched a product called the Surface Adaptive Kit. And what the Surface Adaptive Kit does is it has a bunch of tactile indicators for cables, keys, 
um, you know, things like that that are that are purposely built and designed for the surface. Um, and we took that insight that we learned from the blind community, and and that was what helped us create the tactile indicators for keys. Because the insight that we realized is that um, every blind user has a key that they want to to highlight. Um, that's that's one that they want to push, and you know it's it's not universal so we can't put a tactile bump on everything because then there's a tactile bump on nothing so we have to give people the options to personalize their keyboards and that's what the surface adaptive kit did and i'll, I'll show you how i use it on my this little guy here um i actually have this dot on this key because this key locks my pc so for for me this is actually a destructive key so i go up here and i think i'm going to hit delete and i accidentally hit this key and I lock my PC. It's it, it's a bit of a pain sometimes. So for me, I put this tactile indicator on here to basically go, don't hit this key. Um, and then I have these other ones over here, like on the, what's that key? It's on the FN key, that plus, and then the other one. So that's, that's how I use it. So taking that insight, right? You know, what how we think about surface and our ecosystem of devices is that we believe that not every surface is for everybody but that there's a surface for you so we're really looking at these systems of not only how we can make our pcs more inherently accessible but what are the accessories that um that people need to make a a, a more accessible pc ecosystem for them and with the adaptive kit you know we thought about simple aftermarket adaptations um, that enhance the function of people with disabilities while staying true to the elegance of the surface form and that, that was really important to us um, we see a lot of hacks out there in the disability world that involve like duct tape and, and things like that um, so for us making sure that when someone buys a surface device we you know that we're creating premium adaptations for it you know we want them to to have something that um, you know that is that really wor really works well for them so I'm going to move on and I'm going to sorry I'm going to watch for I wasn't watching for questions cool I don't see any so far um, I'm going to move on and I'm going to talk about um, the Xbox adaptive controller and if you've heard of the Xbox adaptive controller it's likely that you've seen our Super Bowl ad for it which was I think in 2019 um, you know, with all these lovely folks, uh, I'll give their names, Owen, Jordan, Grover, Ian, Taylor, Sean, um, you know, these, uh, these folks did really wonderful work for us and we're extremely happy with how that, that ad came out. Actually, let's just play it for a second. Let's see. What we... My name is Grover. Sean. My name is Ian. I'm Taylor. My name is Owen and I am nine and a half years old. I only have one <laughs> and yeah i love video games my friends my family and again video games whenever i play it it makes me feel happy the fun that you get to have with connecting with your friends you make your own rules it's his way of interacting with his friends when he can't physically otherwise do it when i'm playing with a regular controller there's some things that don't work for me it's difficult for me to use both joysticks and the D-pad at the exact same time. And it just slowed me down a bunch more while other people were like... She's never had the freedom to play at the level she knows she could. I never thought it was unfair. I just thought, hey, this is the way it is and it's not going to change. What I like about the adaptive controller is that now everyone can play. I don't even have to look at the controller and just be like looking at the screen like hey yep yep you never want your kid to feel like an outsider or an other one of the biggest fears early on is how will owen be viewed by the other kids <laughs> he's not different when he plays it's a little challenging but that's the whole point of gaming i can hit the buttons just as fast as they can and i think i can crush my friends <laughs> no matter how your body is or how fast you are, you can play. It's a really good thing to have in this world. My name is... So yeah, that was our Super Bowl ad. We really like it. It's funny, I don't get to watch it as much as I used to. I used to watch it every day yeah, in the Inclusive Tech Lab. Um, but I wanted to show this tweet from uh, which came out basically the day after and it's from dear miss hashim 
And uh, she said, today we watched and rewatched and reflected on this Microsoft commercial with first grade. Here are some of their thoughts. Some kids cannot change. It doesn't mean that they can't play. Microsoft did not want the kids to change, so they changed the remote. Yep, that's that's what we did. That they nailed it. That's that's pretty much the story. Um, is recognizing that you know we created something that was a barrier for folks. So one more little bit of thing I'm going to get into, um, and, and this is something that I. I couldn't articulate when we launched the controller. It took me a really long time to really see this in the proper context. I will tell you in all complete honesty, when we were designing the uh, adaptive controller, we never really thought about kids. It really wasn't our, like while the Super Bowl ad was, was great, people would come up to me afterwards and they'd be like, oh, it's a great thing you've done for the children. And I was like, oh, okay, children, sure. I mean, we started the adaptive controller because we were working with veterans. Um, and this article came out about um, well, October of 2020, um, and it's about how video games are saving those who served. And some of the some of the stats in here are about how often, you know, veterans are are more likely to commit suicide than the general public. And when you talk about veterans with disabilities, this this goes up even more. There's another bit in this article by Ken Jones, who is vital to us creating the xbox adapter controller he was he was there from with us from the beginning and i love this quote he says once those disabled veterans were able to get back into gaming they'd come back with a positive attitude towards therapy playing video games was a major plus for them so many people are alive today because of these technologies many would have committed suicide otherwise and that's not hyperbole we heard those stories from people we heard those stories from guys like like this so this is uh, um, on the left there is uh, Corporal Todd Nicely. I, I, you know what, I say that and I keep forgetting to check. He might, his rank might've changed. Both these guys' ranks might've changed. But when we met them, that was Corporal Todd Nicely. And on the right there, is Sergeant Josh Price. And Josh was with us from the very beginning. And you can see the, the setups that they have. Uh, Todd is a, is a quad amputee um, and needs a very bespoke device. And that device that he's using was created before the adaptive controller by Ken Jones. Um, the hands that you're seeing in this video that are setting up uh, um, Josh's uh, setup, th those are Ken, those Ken Jones from, from Warfighter Engaged and you know setting up this controller for him. So what's been re really interesting and in, in about this in the context of not only just the controller, but the, the pandemic and everything is that we created the Xbox adaptive controller for gamers with limited mobility. That's who we made it for. But we were inspired to support the mental health of the veterans we partnered with because we heard so many stories again and again of like basically people who are isolated from society coming back and trying to integrate into society. And if you have a disability that takes away video games from you, something that every veteran who's in service today grew up with, hearing those stories of like, I can't even play video games with like my my fellow like squad um, is just, you know, it's just so, so heartbreaking. And I think, you know, when people ask us, this was a time before I think accessibility was uh, you know, as accepted as it is now, which is great. I mean, it's great that things are like this the way they are now. But people would ask, like, well, how did you convince people to do this? And I will say that I think it, there is a certain amount of kismet of us working with the veteran community um, because we had veterans on our team. And when you hear these stories um, about like how isolated people are and, and how their mental health is affected by not being able to play video games. It was never a question of why should we do this? It was always a question of how. And, you know, for the core team that made it, it was always a question of how should we do it? So, yeah, I'm going to kind of move on. So <laughs> these are our principles at Microsoft of inclusive design. Um, I'm going to go through them in more detail, um, but these are the sort of foundational pieces of how we think about um, our inclusive design practice and it. Um, and I'll put it in context of the adaptive controller. So recognize exclusion. Exclusion happens when we solve problems using our own biases. At Microsoft, as Microsoft designers, we seek out those exclusions and use them as opportunities to create new ideas and inclusive designs. Um, so yeah, this one, 
the reason why I call what the presentation recognized exclusion is that this one is the the hardest one in many ways. Because you know, that first line, we solve problems using our own biases. It might as well be saying, like, we solve problems using our own experiences. Because in many ways, that's what obviously what creates bias. We're we're shaped by our world. And how do you for many things, like when it comes to design, you know, how do you design for someone else? Um, and the answer, you know, is, you know, as we will get into is that, you know, you have to engage. So let me talk about controllers first and the mismatches in game controllers. This is our uh, Xbox Gen 8 controller. We are currently on Gen 9. So if you buy an Xbox Series uh, X slash S, it has a Gen 9 controller. This photo is of a Gen 8 controller. The only real difference is the Gen 9 controller has an extra button for share. And so that what are the mismatches in these controllers? And I will say like generation eight. So there have been eight full generations all the way back from like the Atari 2600 um, through like the original Nintendo controller, things like that, that um, shaped what controllers are. And let's talk about the assumptions that we make when we design controllers. You know, we assume that a user is gonna have two hands to operate it and two thumbs to operate the sticks. That's an assumption of game controllers. We assume that people have the fine motor controls to hit all the buttons. There are 17 buttons on a Gen 8 Xbox controller. Um, and sometimes game designers assume that people can hit two buttons at the same time. We assume that people can reach around to the bumpers and triggers, like that they have that, that ability to reach with their index finger and get to those, like four of those 17 buttons. We assume that people can hold it for an extended period of time, that they have the endurance to be able to like hold this thing. And that I will say like when we first started in Xbox, that was a really tricky one for folks because you'd get a lot of like, the, the funny thing about working in Xbox, there's this, obviously a lot of you will probably hear this, know this saying of you are not the user. Um, but when you work in Xbox, it doesn't really work that way because by many metrics, of how we define success at Xbox, our employees are the whales of our industry. They're the best users, right? They play the most, they buy the most, they use the services the most. So our job has always been to like kind of encourage people to tell them that they're not the only user. So this was always hard because people are like, well, what are you talking about too heavy? I hold this thing for 12 hours on Saturday. And I'm like, oh, yeah, I know, but not you, someone else. You know, and, and we always kind of have to bring it back to the community and show those examples. So this next principle, um, learn from diversity. Human beings are the real experts in adapting to diversity. Inclusive design puts people in the center from the very start of the process. And those fresh, diverse perspectives are the key to true insight. There's a saying in the disability community that we really try to live by. Um, and it's one that, Sorry, I'm just reading a question. Oh yeah, okay. I'm gonna to get to that question, uh, Christina, just a second. Um, <laughs> uh, there's there's a saying in the, the disability community called um, nothing about us without us. Um, you know, I, the origins that I've traced it back to uh, are um, in the early, I think it was late 70s or early 80s when the FCC was doing, um, was writing laws to um, include the deaf community. The deaf community was like, don't make things without us because they weren't in the room with the, with the lawmakers. So that is something that's really important to us. We really strive to um, sort of say that. Uh, and whenever I meet uh, designers who want to get into um, inclusive design, I always have to stress like, who do you know with disabilities? And if they tell me none, then I'm like, well, first, first job is to go meet some people with disabilities. So let's talk a bit about, and try to answer Christina's question. Uh, the communities that we referenced, gamers with learning abilities, veterans. Okay, so how did we um, identify, reach out and engage them around their experiences? Um, you know, it's, it's interesting, sorry, Christine, I'm gonna dance around this a bit. Um, it's interesting because when, when the controller came out, I got a lot of questions from design press asking me how we validated the design. And I couldn't answer them in a way that the design press found 
the, the design press could grok. And because the, they were expecting me to basically say, well, here is our protocol of how we validated all of this. You know, this was the testing protocol that we used. And the truth of the matter is, is that we brought in, um, we started with Warfighter Engage. That's where Ken Jones is from. We brought in Able Gamers. We brought in Special Effect. Able Gamers is the largest gaming accessibility charity in the UK, special effect, or in the US. Special Effect is the largest gaming accessibility charity in the UK. Um, we brought in Craig Hospital, which is a spinal cord and brain injury hospital in Denver. And we brought in the Cerebral Palsy Foundation. And if you know anything about like hardware development at a company like us, or, or like maybe that poor guy at Apple who once left the iPhone 4 prototype in a bar, um, Hardware development is extremely secretive. Most people in Microsoft don't know the hardware we're making um, at any given time. In fact, there are people on the hardware team that don't know what other members of their own team are making. It, hardware development is intentionally um, very uh, confidential. But when it came to the Xbox adaptive controller, we knew from the very beginning that that was not gonna work. So we brought all five of these charities in from even before the first prototype, like when we were pitching the idea, these charities were involved, they knew, they knew what we were doing the whole time. And, you know, we had people from these charities in our beta program. Um, okay, sorry, I'm just reading questions. Uh, I will say that one of the, one of the great privileges we have at Microsoft, to be honest, is being such a big company too. We also have a large internal community that we can talk to um, very openly with. So um, that's always extremely helpful. And all of our teams, you know, over the years at Microsoft, we've just been continually trying to hire more people with disabilities into our roles. Um, and, you know, everyone on the devices accessibility team has some kind of disability. I'm probably the most invisible, <laughs> um, but you know, that's that's just kind of how we roll. So, you know, I think what's interesting is if you look at these photos from Special Effect, you can see all different types of of ability and and one of the and everything. But one of the things that we noticed when we started working with these folks was that there was always someone in the background. There was always a caregiver. So we weren't just designing this device for the people who, the gamers with disabilities, we were designing this device, keeping the needs of the caregiver in mind, keeping the needs of all these charities in mind, because all these charities were makers. They were basically building game controllers from scratch. And, you know, before, we, were, we were primarily there to build them a device that would accelerate their rigs getting to people. And that's, that's you know, I think we've been very successful at, at that aspect of it, which is like, you know, I don't think any of these charities think about, would go back to how they built game controllers before the adaptive controller. Um, so yeah, that's that's thing. I'm gonna take a minute just to kind of see if I can answer any more questions. Da, da, da. Oh. So Michael has a question, um, how did we figure out the size of accessibility audiences that need to be served? Um, our chief accessibility officer, uh, Michael, and you're gonna hate this, um, ROI is a trap. Um, if you have to, so what do I mean by that is if I, and this is completely condescending and I mean every bit of it. Um, if I get a PM that comes up to me and goes, well, how big is this market anyway? I feel sorry for them because they're afraid of people with disabilities. And that might sound awful. I don't care. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like we definitely have a point of view in this. And I recognize this privilege at Microsoft that we do not, while we do use data a lot to, um, to sort of shape how we go about things, we don't ever use data to pitch. Um, not not really in that way. We don't need to at, at, at Microsoft. And and again, I, I, every time I say that, I recognize how huge a privilege that is. But hopefully, as an industry, we're going to do that. You know, um, intentionally not like intentionally not including people with disabilities in the products that you make. There's a word for that and it's discrimination, right? So let's like, you know, you don't wanna to come too heavy on people but that's what it is, <laughs> right? So uh, that, that's, that's how we kind of think about that one. Um, 
that last question, uh, Eleonora, about uh, inclusive design, universal design, accessibility, can we save that to the end? I'm going to, because that one sounds good at the end. Uh, cool. Sorry, I, I'm not used to answering questions in the middle, but I, I love it. So let's talk about this last one, um, solve for one extend many. This is the real secret. Um, and I think about this one a lot because this is where, where the real power comes in. And I think as designers, this is about synthesis. This is about elegance. Um, if you look at our inclusive design material, and it says here, you know, everyone has abilities and limits to those abilities. Designing for people with permanent disabilities actually results in designs that benefit people universally. Constraints are a beautiful thing. Um, the accessibility community for years has said, if you make something accessible, it works better for everybody. Um, how do you, that's a nice generalization, but how do you, how do you make that into something like what is the the tangible step that that is and how do you think about it? And for, for us, like for Microsoft, if you look at our material, we talk about, and we didn't invent this. This is something that the community um, invented, um, which is you talk about permanent, temporary and situational, um, either disability or limitations. I don't wanna say that there's a situational disability. I don't wanna, I don't want to uh, demean what disability is. So I tend to say permanent disabilities, temporary and, and situational limitations. So what's the example? The canonical one that we use is that if you're someone who um, is limb different and you're, you have one hand, uh, that's a permanent disability. If you have broken an arm and you cannot use one arm, that is a temporary limitation. If you are holding a baby, um, you are situationally limited to one hand because your other hand is busy. So that's how we think about the this sort of reverse funnel of designing for for folks um, and then expanding that out across permanent temporary and situational um, sort of aspects now i like to take this idea to talk about um interrelated disability i used to i used to say intersectional disability but i kind of i don't want to abuse that word intersectional because it does have it's so important um, so I, I've been starting to say interrelated disability. And so let, let me get into that in, in this sort of next example. So this is a, a friend of ours. He comes to the Inclusive Tech Lab. We met him at Harborview. Um, we would sometimes do game nights before the pandemic at Harborview Medical in Seattle. And um, he is a, what they would call a high tetraplegic. Um, he literally cannot move anything below his neck. So we have Caitlin here, who's one of our um, uh, occupational therapist, and she's setting him up with a mouth controller that's plugged into the Xbox adaptive controller. So what that is, is a, a joystick that plugs that uh, he uses with his lips and there's a tube in it and he blows into the tube and that's one action and he sucks on the tube and that's a separate action. And it also does long and short. So you can actually have four buttons there and not just two. Um, but you know, this was one of the use cases that we had to think about um, sort of really high tetraplegics um, with what we would say, like, you know, no fine motor control, um, no strength, no reach, things like that. Um, and how we would um, design a system for them. So I'm going to talk about another friend of ours, uh, Cherry Ray, and they have a very different um, perspective and condition um, that limits how they play. So uh, they have a condition called ethler Donlow syndrome. Um, it makes it very hard for them to press those buttons on uh, joysticks. So on a game controller, the sticks are also buttons. So they're also they're a joystick, but if you press on them, they're also buttons. And game designers, you know, need as many buttons they, as they can get. So they, they use those stick buttons. But for folks who have really limited strength, pressing those joysticks as buttons is really hard. So we have a feature on uh, Xbox called Copilot, which allows, and, and Copilot, I will say, um, the adaptive controller would not be the form that it is without Copilot. Because if you look at what Cherry's got going on here, they have two controllers that are hooked up to the Xbox and the Xbox thinks of them as one controller. So they remap those two big buttons on the adaptive controller to the problematic buttons that they have on a regular controller. So in this case, the stick presses. And then all they have to do is let their hands drop, let gravity do the work 
their hands will hit those big buttons instead of using muscle to press those stick those um, thumbstick buttons. So this is how they uh, uh, this is how they've configured the adaptive controller. So it's really simple in this case. It's just two controllers. But in the other case, there's a lot of peripherals and mouth joysticks and other things that can be plugged in. And so for us, when I talk about interrelated and in product, we have to think about how all these different types of, of conditions and people who are going to use it um, are going to interact with your device. Whew. All right. Um, so let me see where I'm at. I got lots of time. Cool. Um, and is there any question? Okay, oh, yeah, good. Uh, so you know, let's let me just kind of sum up a little bit here. So recognize exclusion. Our traditional game controller um, is optimized around a primary use case that makes assumptions about how it's used. We had to recognize that when someone um, can't use our controller the way it was designed, that it was the barrier. That was that was our fault. We designed the disability. And I think as designers, that's a really tricky thing to kind of wrap your head around. Um, but it really is important. You know, um, we talk a lot about edge cases, you know, and I think it's Mike Montanero. I got to actually verify this, but I think he actually said, you know, there are no edge cases because as designers, we design who the center is. Like we say who the center is. Um, and, and this really did speak to me because my first sort of major project um, going beyond compliance and accessibility is I designed the digital library for the Canadian National Institute for the Blind back in 2003, long time ago. My customers were blind. They were the center. If anything, I excluded sighted people in the design of that device. So it, it is interesting when we talk about things like edge cases, because, you know, we have to recognize that we put in the center. So the edges are defined by where we put the center. So learn from diversity, you know, we engaged across the gaming accessibility community and we're given not only insight into the functionality of the device and what it enables, but how the form reflects on the user. So this was given to us by Richard Ellison of the um, Cerebral Palsy Foundation. Um, it's funny, this is a funny story because I, he was visiting Microsoft, he was just leaving to go to the airport and I showed him a sketch of what the latest direction of the adaptive controller, which came out to be the direction of the adaptive controller. And Richard talked to me for 45 minutes about how I was wrong <laughs> and how I was going to other people with this design. Uh, and it was it was very enlightening. And it was an introduction that we we thoroughly needed, which is this idea of stigma. And it's something that I think we think about a lot. But I don't want to say we've we've cracked. Um, so what do I mean by stigma? You know, a lot of uh, assistive devices can be very medical looking. They can other you by using it. So we always were going to make the adaptive controller and a consumer device, but it was vitally important that we made it look as cool as possible and, and, and have it be harmonious in the family of Xbox devices. And our, and the, the designer of the adaptive controller, um, Chris Kajowski, you know, did a wonderful job um, of doing that because it really is. It's like you don't want to be the kid who's using the the weird the the medical controller while you, all your friends are doing the the other one. And you know, it's hard to. It's a little bit hard sometimes to think about this. But if you, I mean, I came from a time when wearing glasses was uncool, and you'd be called names for wearing glasses. So if you think about the stigma around glasses, I don't think anyone thinks of glasses as, as um, a medical device. Cause you know, whenever I talk to people about like assistive technology, they're like, oh, I've never, I've never encountered such a thing. And most of the time they're wearing glasses and I'm like, oh really, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, because you know, how would you see without those things that you have on? So thinking about the, how the form of the device reflects on the user and the stigma that's involved in that is something that I think is a huge opportunity for us in our practice. Um, and something that we, we really need to explore. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't want to say I've cracked the code. It's like, oh, I have a good question. That's pretty much where we're at. So solve for one, extend to many. You know, we looked at unique cases in people's mobility as well as their situation, whether they're a gamer or a caregiver or a maker. And the Xbox adaptive controller, you know, allows people to build a controller that fits them. We think a lot about fit, right? Um, you know, we get a lot of people that come into the inclusive tech lab. Um, well, at least we used to. We we haven't uh, we haven't had we haven't been hosting people in a while. 
And, uh, you know, if they're injured, if they recently acquired an injury, they tend to tell us what they can't do, um, which is always really interesting. So if like you have like someone who recently lost a hand, they come in and they go, well, I need a one-handed controller. And we go, well, why? And they go, well, I only have one hand. And then we kind of politely ask them, well, stop telling me what you're missing and start telling me what you can do. Can you move your feet, your knees? How's your elbows, your head? You know, what, what can we, where do you have movement that we could put a control? And that was a, that was a big part of how we, we thought about the adaptive controller. Cool. Okay, sorry, I'm trying to look at chat as well. So that was my story on the Xbox adaptive controller and kind of how we, we developed that. I wanted to give you something. I don't typically give folks this. This is something we've published because I hope um, I hope it can be useful for people. Um, we created this guide called Understanding Function and Design for Disabilities. And oops, oh, it's timed. That's why. Oh, look how slow it is. <laughs> so <laughs> we uh, one of the things that we see in our practice is that we see engineers and designers spend a lot of time trying to understand diagnoses or conditions. And honestly, it's counterproductive um, for, for the vast majority of the people I work with. Like we're not medical professionals and striving to have that vocabulary in that context is sometimes counterproductive. So we wanted to create a reference that helped them not think about conditions. So like, you know, the example I always give is like glaucoma versus macular degeneration. It's like, well, you know, you could talk about like how those conditions differ. Oops, sorry, these are timed, that's why it's going. Um, but it's really just talking about how people's vision is occluded, um, you know, blind spots versus tunnel vision, things like that. So while we believe in nothing about us without us, and we definitely stress that this is not a guide to be used in to replace community um, involvement and talking with the community. This is a guide to give you context and a common vocabulary. Oops, sorry, I apologize. Um, you know, for our inclusive design practice. So we talk about what is cognition, what is mobility, what is vision. What is hearing? What is voice, speech, communication? What is sensation and perception? And this is our first draft. I really need to get back to this and kind of expand this. This is about a year old now. So we break these down into functional aspects and we were inspired to do this by the World Health Organization and their international classification of function um, to really just talk about, about function. So this is how we've broken it down. If you go to that URL, aka.ms slash, and I'll show it again, uh, understanding function, um, you can see, all of this and all the material. Um, it's way more than than what I'm showing you here. But let me give you an example of, of how we've set it up. So here's an example of control, voluntary versus involuntary movement. The ability to perform tasks smoothly with precision without involuntary movements, tremors, or shakiness. So the barrier that we, we always set up, like there's a barrier and a facilitator. Like just to give people that, that context of how to talk about um, these types of functional limitations. So, you know, a mouse cursor sensitive to movements like tremors or unsteadiness, and this can be problematic when you're navigating menus or, or trying to select content. Um, and then the facilitator is uh, settings such as anti-tremoring or filtering can help give people a more forgiving experience. I will tell you, I design hardware and platforms. So this is a very natural sort of answer for me to look at. If I were to tell someone who is designing like say an application or a website, what would the facilitator be for, for this? Um, I'd really just go back to Fitz Law, you know, like make your menus as forgiving and as big as possible. Like large targets are easier to, for everyone to hit, um, especially people with involuntary movement. And there's the URL again. Okay, this last one here, uh, this is my last example. Um, this is an interesting one because you all can probably, uh, go simulate this right now <clears throat> um a sensory system that informs our uh our sense of balance or orientation in our environment vestibular motion of objects across the screen may be undetectable to some while causing extreme dizziness or sickness to others um, and the ability to reduce the motion of objects on a screen can enhance the usability and safety of the experience um this was first brought up by oops by apple um, you know, that's what happens right now in the Apple OS. They, 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 they had that challenge. 
So I'm going to stop sharing and I would love to kind of take some questions. I'm just going to struggle to kind of see people. I'd love to see people. Oh, wait, maybe we can't do that with this. That's fine. Um, oh, thanks for putting the, the link in the, in the chat there to understand to our framework. So let's get back to, uh, is it Eleonora? Am I saying that right? Um, uh, how we think about the relationship between inclusive design and universal design and accessibility. I am a super wonk about this and I don't want to say that I'm right uh, because I am a I am a super wonk about it. So the way I think about it is inclusive design is a set of methods. Inclusive design is um, is the journey. Accessibility is the goal. Uh, oh no, wait. Accessibility. So he, sorry. Let me take a step back um, because I think the head of inclusive design at Adobe wrote an article once, and the way that. Um, his name is Matt May, and the way that he described it is my favorite way of, of talking about this is um, accessibility is the mountain. Universal design is the summit, and inclusive design is climbing the mountain. <laughs> and so what I mean by that is, you know, it really is about this process, right, of, of going in early. And what I do think, uh, what I do think about some people sometimes use inclusive design um, as a synonym for like shift left accessibility, which is just to do accessibility practices up front. And I'm also not really a fan of that. And the reason is, um, so I the, the person who, who really helped me sort of start, not only start the Microsoft inclusive design journey, but like helped me like start my journey um, was a man named August de los Reyes, who, you know, tragically we've lost uh, about a year ago. And August used to talk about the difference between inclusive design and accessible design as a, as these, in these, these types of framings, whereas accessibility really kind of comes from this clinical place. It is a very engineering focused sort of approach, which is this idea of, well, there's a barrier, what's the facilitator that you can design to get over the barrier, right? And I liked, always liked how he said that that's typically how accessibility is approached. Whereas inclusive design, he was like, well, what if we just didn't design the barrier? Like, what if we didn't have to make the accommodation to get over it? And that that's always been kind of what we strive for. So he always talked about it in terms of like civil engineering versus urban planning and things like that. And, and that's that's how I've always th thought about it. And I think, you know, when to talk about the difference between what we think about at Microsoft with inclusive design and, and I think what people typically think about universal design, I guess and here's another, you know, thing where I'm going to probably be, uh, you know, different just for the sake of it. This idea of universal design as um, one size fits all, which I know is, is a, a, sim a simplistic way of talking about universal design, um, is, is not, it feels, it doesn't feel modern. It, it, feels, it feels like the idea of universal design that came out of the built environment, like out of all that stuff that came out of Berkeley, you know, curb cuts and all of that is this idea of like, well, how do I design this thing so that everyone can participate in this space? Whereas, you know, we think about inclusive design coming from the digital world, which is like, there isn't, there isn't necessarily one form, right? Like computers and software experiences can be personalized. They don't have to be one thing. They can kind of bend and mold and fit to you. So I always like to talk about universal design, probably again, unfairly, where it's like, everyone gets an extra large t-shirt, which, you know, for most people, it's gonna be too big. And for me, it'll probably be a little tight. Uh, you know, and, and so, you know, yeah, it kind of works, but does it really work well? And do we have to do that? Everyone gets one size of t-shirt. We have different sizes of t-shirts. So that, that's how I kind of think about it. You should go find Matt's article, Matt May's article. It's, it's a little while ago. I should dig it up. It's really, it's really good. Is there, are there any more questions? I will say, Mike, it's really interesting. Yeah, coming from, I, I never really liked universal design either, but like now that I'm doing a lot of education stuff, universal design for learning is not what you would traditionally think about universal design is. So it's, 
its core meaning is really lost. Um, and I will also say too, that now I mostly do hardware. I certainly have a respect for the built environment that I didn't have when I, when I worked on software, <laughs> you know, like there's a, a, there's a thing that I like to tell software people. It's like atoms are not bits, right? Like, you know, when a software designer uh, or when a software engineer tells you that something's impossible, what they usually mean even indirectly is that they don't have enough time, right? So like, have you ever gotten that idea? Like, oh, that's impossible. And what they're really saying is, oh, I don't have enough time to do that. But like when a hardware engineer tells you that something's impossible, sometimes they mean physics. And, you know, and that's, that's really different. <laughs> Cool. Well, I hope this was helpful. I tend to go on. You could go. I would listen to you if you went on for another <laughs> hour, Bryce. I, uh, I've been, I've been taking a lot of notes and, uh, you can get, you can bet I'll be sharing this with uh, a whole bunch of students tomorrow morning. Oh, great. Uh, everybody. Thank you so much for, uh, for coming out tonight and, uh, and listening to Bryce, I, I know I've been inspired uh, and based on a lot of your comments in the chat, I think um, I'm not the only person in the room. Oh, there's a couple of Q&As that have come up since. Wait. Oh, yes, Jessica. And uh, so when did Microsoft start focusing on inclusivity? Um, I mean, I've been at Microsoft a long time. We've always had an accessibility culture inside, but we've made some big mistakes. Um, probably starting from the launch of Windows 10. Uh, well, not starting there. Uh, let me just put that stake in the ground. We made a ton of mistakes when we launched Windows 10 and we had to dig ourselves out of a hole. And, you know, our chief accessibility officer, Jane Lee Fleury, has done a lot to, um, to sort of build that culture around the company. Um, we started thinking about our inclusive design methodology back in 20. 14, 2014, I think. Um, that's when August and Kat kind of like um, sort of laid that foundation. Um, and and you know I think I think that's where where it kind of evolved from. Uh, I will say you know inclusive design at Microsoft is still many things to many people. It really does depend on who you talk to. So for a lot of folks, that whole accessibility upfront thing is inclusive design, and I can't really argue with them. I feel differently about it. Jessica, how do we feel about financial inclusion? <laughs> yeah, that's a, I mean, oh, you know, Jessica, this is a really hard one for me. And I might not, I know that people with disabilities are, um, are, are you know, are, you know, I know, I know the statistics about like, um, the the employment gap of people with disabilities, you know, it's like two to one. Um, I will say actually tomorrow morning, or no, Friday morning, they're going to um, launch some new numbers. And it's actually been the past few months have been really encouraging. Uh, there are more people employed right now with disabilities um, than have ever been employed with disabilities since they started basically counting in 2008. But I think that you know, a lot of it would be what we would call frontline worker jobs. And so, you know, yeah, it's interesting to see the data on how um, people with disabilities at the beginning of the pandemic lost, where they lost and where they're coming back from. But let's talk about financial inclusion. Um, we know it's important with the Xbox adaptive controller. We, we knew we had to set a price and we knew that price um, was going to be a hundred dollars and we made choices that you know, we we could have done things differently, but it would have put the price over $100. And I talk about this with the community a lot um, because I want to provide consumer level quality and, and non-stigmatizing things to people with disabilities. Um, and I know that it can't be expensive, but I also like, I can't do it for free either. So, you know, just to be completely upfront, like a regular Xbox controller is $60. The adaptive controller is $100. Um, the adaptive controller does way more stuff than a regular controller does from a software perspective. 
Um, and the thing is, is we make millions of regular controllers. We make thousands of adaptive controllers. It's just a different scale. So for me, like these, it, it, my competitors, when it comes to like creating accessible hardware, I either have like medical stuff, which is, which is incredibly price inflated because of things like medical insurance. Like, it's just ridiculous. Like, and I understand like why things cost that much because they don't have any volume, but I still think like it's too high. Um, and then on the other side, I have a competitor, which is basically duct tape and cardboard, you know, like I have um, people just kind of, you know, doing crafts to, to give themselves the um, some some accommodation they need, and, and both are valid, and both I understand why, but I'm trying to find the sweet spot in the middle. I hope that answers your question. I don't think it did, but I don't necessarily think I have a really good answer for that. I, I will say that I, personally, I'm not I'm not trying to provide the cheapest thing possible. I'm, I'm, I think about value. So, but yeah, I hear you though. It, I mean, before the adaptive controller, uh, anything that was like it was $400. So we dropped it to a hundred. So I feel pretty good about that aspect, but you know, the community keeps us in check and they rightfully should. Yeah. Are there more questions? Oh, yeah, there are. Shoot. I keep missing a scroll. Uh, Dominic has a question. I was doing accessibility research for Microsoft. Oh, that's cool. That's, that's nice. I'd love to hear more about what it was like back then. Huh. Uh, do you get feedback on what attachments are most popular to pair with the adaptive controller? Uh, all the time, Michael. Um, and it's always interesting because what people tend to do is they tend to tell me what they need. and. Uh, and they tend to say like, you did a pretty good job, but this is what would make it amazing. And they tell me what they need and they don't, without necessarily understanding that it would add cost to the device and it would exclude people who are not like them. Um, so it's, I, I totally get how it's hard to find that balance. So I, I often just sort of nod and listen to people, but most of the time I get a lot of people who are like, uh, great first attempt, but this is what's going to put you over the top next time. And what they're talking about is like, I'm a quadriplegic and this is what quadriplegics need. And without knowing that they're whatever we put in for quadriplegics is going to cost money that someone like, say, with muscular dystrophy would be paying for and not using. <laughs> I think that's the last of the questions. I hope I answered them all right. I don't want to stop us before you before you uh, before everyone's had a chance to ask anything that they have left. I don't see any more though. Folks, thank you so much and uh, Bryce, I can't I can't thank you enough either. Um, these will be your this video will be posted on the uxpa.org um, archive of uh, webinars uh, probably within 24, 48 hours. Everybody stay safe. Um, if you're up in the north where I am, uh, stay indoors right now. It's uh, coming down hard with a big snowstorm. And uh, we will see everyone again very soon. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, everybody. I'm going to figure out how to stop that.